morning church. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about those who have died. We don't want you to be sad like other people, those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died, but we also believe that he rose again. So we believe that God will raise to live life through Jesus, any who have died and bring them together with him when he comes. What we tell you now is the Lord's own message. Those of us who are still living when the Lord comes again will join him, but not before those who have already died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the people who have died and were in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive at the time will be gathered up with those who have died. We will be taken off in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, we don't need to write to you about times and dates. You know very well that the day when the Lord comes again will be a surprise, like a thief who comes at night. People will say, we have peace and we are safe. At that time, destruction will come to them quickly, like the pains of a woman giving birth. And those people will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not living in darkness. And so that day will not surprise you like a thief. You are all people who belong to the light. You belong to the day. We don't belong to the night or to darkness. So we should not be like other people. We should not be sleeping. We should be awake and have self-control. People who sleep, sleep at night. People who drink too much, drink at night. But we belong to the day, so we should control ourselves. We should wear faith and love to protect us. And the hope of salvation should be our helmet. God did not choose us to suffer his anger. God shows us our salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for us so that we can live together with him. It is not important if we are alive or dead when Jesus comes. So encourage each other and help each other grow strong in faith, just as you are already doing. Super. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Very good reading. That's a long one today. He's earned that biscuit afterwards. <laughs> okay, here's the outline of what we're looking at. Because this can be a little bit overly technical, I don't want to make it too technical. You may remember that Doug Jacobi spoke on this passage when he was here in December. I refer you back to the recording that's online if you want to look at the more technical aspects, which we won't do so much today. But here's what I see in this passage. Firstly, Paul's aims for the Thessalonians. He doesn't want them to grieve like others do. What will happen to Christians who are alive and those who have already died? That's the question that Paul is answering that the Thessalonians have asked him. Thirdly, what will happen to people who die without Christ? Uh, uh, fourthly, fourth thing, who we are, who we, this, what the passage is dealing with is who we are, children of the light, children of the day, and how to respond to who we are, to be awake, not asleep, to be sober, not drunk. And finally, at the end, God's aims for you and me and then how we respond to that. So Paul's aims for the Thessalonians are firstly, he doesn't want them to grieve like those in the world, who, people who have no hope. Grief is a very real and actually healthy part of life. Grieving in itself is healthy in the sense that we grieve because we care about the person that we've lost. It's because of the presence of love that we have grief. What Paul is talking about is not grieving in general. He's talking about grieving over somebody and not knowing what's going to happen when they have died. That sense of, of loss that is connected to a sense of uncertainty or fear for their destiny. You don't need to grieve like that, he says, when Christians die. You know, um, Penny's not here today. She may be watching online or listening online as she's driving. She's driving back from her dad's place. Uh, she's been visiting her father this weekend because he may not have long to live. Uh, we don't know for sure, but maybe a few weeks. It's very hard to say. But, you know, when but death is something that we all have to reckon with. And it isn't easy, but we do need to be thinking whether we are my generation or Gen Z, still need to think about death because that is where we're all going. And at some point we have to wrestle with that and deal with it. A few years ago, 
it was my privilege to do some Bible studies with a chap called Marvin. Some of you may remember Marvin. Uh, Charles is there in the picture, helping with the baptism at the back of his house there, Penny and uh, myself. And then in the picture is Mark Wells, who's the son of the chap getting baptized there. Marvin didn't have long to live. He had many health problems. So his son, and he's an atheist, and his son, Mar uh, Mark, who I knew, rang me and said, please go and talk to my dad about Jesus. I said, okay. I went to meet Marvin. I said, do you want to talk about Jesus? He said, no. <laughs> I said, do you want to talk about God? He said, no. I didn't say anything else. He just said no. It wasn't a conversation. It was just no. Okay. Uh, do you have any interest in spiritual things? No. I thought, well, this isn't going very well. And I appreciated Mark wanting me to help his father, but we lived near where he was. So one day I went back, I tried, prayed about it. One day I went back and I said, uh, you know you're going to die soon, right? He said, yeah. I said, do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? He said, no. I said, would you like to know what's going to happen to you when you die? And he paused. And he said, yes. So I said, well, I said, then I need to talk to you about Jesus. Jesus. Because he's the only one who's died, experienced that, come back to life and, to, and tells us what happens. So I need to teach you about Jesus from this. He said, okay, you can read from your book. <laughs> That's what he called my Bible. You can read from your book. It took us nine months of nearly every week meeting up. But after nine months, he, he trusted that Jesus really was who he was. He repented of his sins, and he got baptized into Christ. And a few months later, he went home. He is, in the words of this passage, asleep in Christ. And you know, you may say, well, that's Marvin, and he was old, and he was ill, and yeah, sure. But none of us know the time of the day when our end will come, and the thing that God wants for all of us is to be confident about what's going to happen. We may not know every detail because God doesn't actually reveal every detail of what happens, but he tells us enough so that we can live confidently in the face of the fact that we will all die. So let's have a, a little look at some of these questions. What will happen to Christians living and dead? So it appears Paul was in Thessalonica for how long? Three weeks or so, he's there, and he's taught them about Jesus, and he's taught them about the fact that Jesus is going to come back. He's now been away from them for about how long? Maybe a year or so. And they have sent a question to him saying, I appreciate you taught us all this about Jesus, and he's going to come back, but some of our members have died over the last 12 months, and we don't know what's going to happen to them because now they're not here. When Jesus comes back, are they going to be okay? Reasonable question. May not seem that strange to us, but it, it certainly was confusing for them because of their, their pagan background too. They don't have much of a Jewish uh, understanding of death and, and, and the next life. So what comes to your mind when we talk about Jesus coming back? What kind of images come to your mind? What kind of ideas, what kind of thoughts, or what do you see people talking about, or hear people talking about? When we talk about Jesus coming back, he's going to come back and bring with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. What kind of things come to mind? The second coming. Jesus coming back. What kind of ideas or images? What do you picture in your mind's eye? Um, loud trumpets. Trumpets. Loud trumpets. Deafening, I would suspect. suspect. Yeah. Well, movie with special effects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus coming back. Things like that. Special effect movies, sort of a Marvel movie moment, <laughs> something a bit like that maybe. Patricia? Like clouds. clouds. Clouds are mentioned here. Yeah, lots of clouds. Yeah. What else? Yeah? Everybody everywhere see him? Will that happen? How will it work? And the, in the whole world, how will that, yeah, the Philippines and Nigeria or somewhere else, yeah, okay. Yeah, 
Other thoughts? Oh, Simon? People raising from the dead. People coming back to life? You mean like that? You know, coming back, raising from the dead? Yeah, I was thinking when the person, you know, was um, wanting to be replaced from the dead, like that, which is people die. Okay, all right. Coming back, people coming back, people raising from the dead. Hmm, anything else? Wakes, um, weather, weather that I've never been seen before. Yeah. Extraordinary weather, yeah. earthquakes, yeah. splitting the earth. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Yeah. A lot of rejoicing, but also a lot of fear. <laughs> a real mix of rejoicing and fear. Mm. I think that's fair enough, isn't it? Now, I'm not going to dig into all of that today. There's other passages in 2 Thessalonians and in Revelation that you need to have a look at. Go and do your own Bible study. This isn't a Bible study in that sense. But I think it's important that we reckon with a couple of things because the general often the picture is something like this, right? That people rise up in the air, as it talks about here in, in fact, in, in not so many words, right? We will meet him. Uh, we will, uh, where are we in this passage? Uh, we won't sleep. The, the, the dead in, in Christ will rise first. Will uh, Those who are still alive and left, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So it sounds a bit like something like this is going to happen. Perhaps you've seen movies, there's a, a big movie franchise that, uh, that portrayed this a little while ago. There's a number of books. Is that what's actually going to happen? Well, I think looking at this passage, we see at least a sequence. We don't have all the details, but we have a sequence. Firstly, Jesus comes back victorious. It's the end of time. It's the end of this current age. He comes back victorious. The sleepers resurrect. In other words, those who've died in Christ. They're called sleepers. Uh, that's a, a common metaphor in uh, the New Testament. For people who've died in Christ, is there a sleep in Christ? So the sleepers resurrect. And then the sleepers and those who are still alive at that point, whatever that is, uh, join Jesus to be with him. Now, in the air is a whole other uh, issue that we'll have to leave for the moment. But the main point is it will be noticed by everybody. It will not be missed by anybody. And how that's going to work, Victor, across the whole world, I have no idea. But I imagine it's not beyond God's power to make it work, right? So uh, the J.B. Phillips translation of this bit, one word of command, one shout from the archangel, one blast from the trumpet of God, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. It's going to be noticed by everybody. There's not going to be any escape. There's not going to be anybody that doesn't notice and isn't involved. It's going to be a huge event. It's going to change everything. It's going to end this existence and start a whole new one. There's a lot of Old Testament imagery, by the way, here in this passage. The idea of the Lord coming on the clouds isn't meant to be literal. In Old Testament prophecies, it was a way of denoting that God is coming in his majesty and his power to his people. So it's not meant to be something we think of literally, but something we think of figuratively. The same thing about being caught up in the air, the image behind that is the idea that we'll be taken out of one in place and existence and joining Jesus in his place and existence. I don't think he's talking literally uh, about up and down because God isn't geographical, right? God isn't up and down. They're just words that show that we're moving from one state to another, from one, in a sense, world to another. And I think that's what's going on here. Everybody will notice. And for those who are with the Lord, it's going to be an excellent outcome. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to be together with him. The sleepers and those alive at the time are going to join him in the air. But so, this is the point, we will be with the Lord forever. That's helpful to the Thessalonians because they're having a lot of persecution. They're having a lot of trials. And so they need to be confident that whatever's happening in this life, at the end of it, they will be with the Lord forever. That's the confidence. That's why he says, encourage one another with these words. So what about the people who die without Christ? First of all, he talks about times and dates. He says, we don't need to talk about that. Uh, you know that the day will come like a thief. People are saying peace and safety, but destruction will come suddenly. Like labor pains on a pregnant woman, woman, they will not escape. So those who die without Christ will not rise to be with Christ. They won't be with him forever. They'll rise to judgment, but that's another lesson from another passage. But they're not going to have this blessing. They're not going to have, sadly... They're not going to be able to enjoy this wondrous event with 
rejoicing. They're going to experience this event with presumably fear. He says, that day we don't know about. Even Jesus said, I don't know the day. So there's no point in speculating. It comes like a thief in the night. I walked back into my house yesterday. I went out to pray in the morning and I came back into my house. I came through the back way into the back and I had a key open the door. And as I opened the door, I heard a thump in the house. And Penny was away, right? I was like, there's a burglar in my house. Turns out it was like a squirrel on the roof or something, thumping his feet. But for a moment, for a moment, like there was a wine bottle near the back door, I picked it up. <laughs> I did, I picked it up, walked through the house with a wine bottle in my hand. Right? I mean, you just, you just don't know what, what's gonna happen. But it's, it's like, it's, it's gonna be like a thief in the night, you don't expect it. And if you don't expect it, you can't speculate about it. And I don't know about you, I suggest, suggest strongly, you don't go online and type in, when is Jesus coming back? Because you'll have a million web pages to read with everybody speculating and saying that the Ukrainian war is, is, the next, is you know, that's, Jesus is definitely coming back now because of Putin. Uh, we have no idea. If Paul didn't know, who are we to think we would know? We don't, we really don't know. The point is to be ready, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, the peace and safety thing, when people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come of them, that was a Roman slogan. It was a slogan of the day. So this is the Roman Empire. We do all kinds of things you don't like, but we bring you peace and we bring you safety. On one of the coins, like the back of that coin there, you'll see Pax, that's, the, that's peace. And a lot of the coins, you'll see the goddesses or gods of victory, in other words, safety, the, the warrior, uh, successful warrior uh, gods and goddesses and the gods or goddesses of peace. That was their slogan, peace and safety. And what Paul is saying here is depending on human measures of peace and safety are a false confidence. Uh, the stock market, whatever, it's, you can't depend on that for your safety. The, uh, your retirement fund your hopes in this world. You can't rely on those. It has to be God. And the labor pains, he says, they come on you suddenly. Um, I, I can't, of course, relate. I have seen my wife in labor twice, and that was enough to put me off. Um, <laughs> so I admire all the mothers. My goodness, well done. Um, what he's saying about the labor pains is it's inevitable this day will come. If, 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 you're, if you're having a baby, then you're having a baby, right? I mean, when the labor pains start, you're not saying like, no, no, I'd like to go on holiday to Tenerife for two weeks. You're, you've got to get on with it, right? It's inevitable. That's, it's saying the same thing about the coming of Christ. It's, it's inevitable. So what are we called to be like as a result of the glorious event that's going to happen, that everybody's going to notice, and the fact that it's going to come like a thief and like labor pains, we're called to be people who are awake and sober. That's his conclusion. That's, we're not in the darkness. We're children of light, children of the day. We don't belong to the night. We don't belong to the darkness. So let's not be like those who sleep through life. He uses the sleep word again here, but from a different perspective, right? Don't sleep through life. Don't get drunk. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober and put on. He's telling us to be decisive here. So we don't drift through life. And especially as Christians, we don't drift through the Christian life. We deliberately seek to be more Christ-like. We look for channels to allow God to move in our lives, to make us more like him. And we put on faith and we put on love and we put on hope. We choose faith instead of doubt. We choose love instead of selfishness, should we say? We choose hope instead of despair. And that's, that's why we have personal devotional times with God. Or at least it's why I do. I cannot maintain any kind of faith or any kind of Christ-like love or any kind of real hope in my heart if I'm not close to God. It becomes fake after a while. I can go through the motions, right? But it's not real anymore. 
We have what we call quiet times. It doesn't matter what you call them. We have these times of focused attention with God, reading his word and praying and, and, and being aware of his presence because we need him to strengthen our faith and our love and our hope because it's under attack all the time. Under attack. We are awake. We live awake. We're real about our faith. It matters to us. We take it seriously. You matter in the kingdom of God. Every single person here, from Gen Z up to Gen whatever. Well, Alpha's coming next, so I don't know what to, I don't know. I don't know where we go, but let's just say it doesn't matter where we are. Every one of us matters. It doesn't matter if you've been here for two weeks or you've been here 20 odd years. It doesn't matter if you're young or you're old. It doesn't matter what country you're, you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter how many spiritual gifts you think you have or you think you don't have. It doesn't matter how weak you are on some level because we're all weak. It doesn't matter how victoriously you've lived your Christian life according to some definition that who knows where that came from or whether you feel like you stumbled through the Christian life and have no idea why you're still here. It really doesn't matter what you think of yourself in that sense. God chose you. God did not make a mistake. You're valuable. You're important in the kingdom of God because you're important to Jesus. You have something to offer. You have something to offer Christ that he can use to his glory to bring other people so that they can enjoy the day that's being talked about here. They can rejoice when the trumpet sounds and not be in fear. We live in the day. We live soberly. We live with faith, hope, love. The Roman breastplate, the Roman helmet. You know, if you went into battle, you put those on, right? He didn't forget. I mean, the, the barbarian hordes are approaching. You don't think, oh, that's, that's, that's a, oh, well, never mind. I'll just pop outside and have a chat with them. They're coming at you wielding axes and big old swords. You put on your breastplate. You put on your helmet. You pick up your sword. Yeah, you know, we are under attack. It's not an attack we need to ultimately fear because Jesus has defeated sin and death. But still, we're human and vulnerable. And that's why... We are deliberate about our Christian life, not drifting through it. What does this mean? Well, I'll give you one, one idea, I think, for today. And perhaps you could reflect for yourself on what it means for you. But I think part of what it means to be awake, not asleep, and sober, not drunk, is, is to make use of the ways that God has provided us to be stronger and to grow in Christ. And one of those ways is our relationships. It's the love we have for one another and the willingness we have with one another to help each other to think highly of Jesus Christ and to explore how we might become more like him together. Helping each other in Christ likeness. Um, recently, I was praying with a friend of mine who's a Christian. And uh, we were praying early in the morning, and we had a lovely time praying together, on the phone, actually. And, but before we prayed, this chap said, before we pray, Malcolm, I just need to tell you something. And he proceeded to share with me very vulnerably about his temptations. And I was really moved. I, I was just walking through the park on my phone, you know, we were about to pray, and I thought, we'll pray, but before... He, first of all, wanted to get off his heart some things he was struggling with. I didn't ask him. I, I didn't expect it. He just volunteered it. And I was really moved because, it's, I mean, I mean, we're friends, but we're not. I don't know him that well. And it, what it told me is he values his connection with God even more as, than whether I feel badly about him. Now he's being this vulnerable. He values God's relationship with him more importantly than what I think. I was, I was really moved. I, I was, I was going to say impressed. It's not the right word. 
I was just, I was touched and I, I was humbled. That's what it was. I was humbled by that, that vulnerability. That's something we can help each other with. Listening to each other's struggles. Sin struggles, I mean. Just being honest. We're all sinners, right? I mean, maybe you don't think you are, but this is the wrong church for you then. So <laughs> but we, uh, we are all sinners. Why not be like honest about it? A second conversation I had this week was with a friend of mine who leads a church in Madrid. And we were talking about many things. And I loved the way that towards the end of the conversation, we had a lovely chat. And he said, Malcolm, how can I support you? What do you need from me? He's in Madrid. I'm not going to see him very often. Maybe once a year, most I would think. But I appreciated the question. And so I shared a few thoughts with him for things he could pray about. Isn't that a good question? How can I support you in your faith? Just an open question about asking that kind of question. It helps us stay awake and sober to do these kind of conversations. And I had another conversation with another friend of mine this week. We talked about many things. We're old friends as Christians. And uh, I don't see him all that often, but I did see him this week. And we had a conversation. And I just felt prompted to ask him a question about his faith. And so I said to him, I said, how are, I, didn't, I didn't know quite how to phrase it. So I just said, how are you doing spiritually? And he looked at me like, I don't know what that means. Because that, that phrase could mean anything, really. But he said, that's a good, I don't know. Well, oh, um, I think, uh, uh, and it provoked him to think. And he shared a few thoughts with me. And it was kind of funny how it went. But it was real. I don't know who's the best question. I don't know. But we'd spent an hour talking about many things, but we hadn't talked about our faith. Didn't seem right. Didn't seem healthy. So I offer those as examples from my week of things that I think help me stay awake and sober in my faith. And maybe we could practice some of that amongst each other this week. Asking questions. How can I support you in your faith? How are things between you and God? Um, is there anything we could talk about? Here's, here's some of my temptations. I'd like you to please, please pray for me. And by the way, just to make it clear, this is not opening up the um, opening us up to uh, uh, like having a board of inquiry over each other. <laughs> You struggle with that? What is wrong with you? Right, I'm going to convene a board of inquiry and we're going to have a public inquiry about all of your temptations. We're not talking about that. Neither are we talking on the other extreme of being flippant. You're struggling with that? Yeah, everybody does. Anyway, so well, what are you doing after church? <laughs> Flippancy's out and so is judgmental over inquisitiveness. I don't, I don't know what to call it. Right? But in between, which is actually quite a big field, there's loving concern for one another's faith. I think that's healthy. I think I need it. Maybe many of us do. So to wrap up, in all of what we talked about here, God has an aim. Paul had an aim to answer the question and help them not to grieve like the world does and be confident. But God has some aims. Paul says here, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. That's not the destiny he wants for anybody here but to receive salvation through Christ who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, in other words, whether we are still living when Jesus comes back or whether we've already died, either way, we may live together with him. Jesus wants you with him. He wants you with him. He wants you, you with him as soon as possible, but maybe not just now, maybe not just today, but I don't know, but he wants you with him. He really does want you. He doesn't want the person sitting next to you. He wants the person sitting next to you too. But it's not, not just that person or the person you think is particularly holy or, or deserving. He wants you together with him. So encourage each other. That's true, you know? Encourage each other. It's true. He wants you and he wants you. Build each other up. Help each other to be sober and awake. Just like you're doing, but like a lot of times in this letter, it seems like Paul is saying you're doing it, but... Do it some more. You need to do it some more, more and, and more. 
The Lord Jesus Christ wants you. So we're going to take some bread and wine now. And we're going to take this bread and wine as symbols of the body and blood of Christ for what he did for us, that he died for us. And my prayer today, at least, is that as we take this bread and wine, it will strengthen us to stay awake and to be sober so that we can have confidence on the day that Jesus comes back. Let's pray.